Hi. Right. So without further ado, let's get this show on the road. Welcome to the first edition of the Rugby Cold Breakers. Um, and featuring myself and my co-host, hailing all the way from a public school in the West Country, if you believe it, Lawrence. Yeah. Hello. Um, my co-host here, of, of course, the uh, Northern Monkey from uh, from Wigan, league fan via the South Coast. <laughs> Indeed. And that is me, apparently. So yeah. let's get let's get into it. A huge, huge week ahead in uh, um, both codes of rugby. We've got a World Cup going on at the moment in Rugby Union, uh, the Women's World Cup. And we've got three World Cups about to launch uh, starting Saturday in Rugby League. Uh, the Men's World Cup, the Women's World Cup and the Wheelchair World Cup, which are all taking place together. And also newly added a physical disability rugby league World Cup, which is uh, more of an exhibition event this time round, um, and will feature Adam Hills playing for Australia. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's all happening, um, and regarding the rugby league World Cup, we've had a round of warm up matches which started with England taking on Fiji last uh, last week. England won 50 nil, which is actually a really good marker for England, I think, because Fiji definitely were not at their best. Let, let's make no bones about it. They probably will be playing a stronger team than they put out in um, the actual comp you know, competitive matches when they start against Australia on Saturday. The fact is, they've been semi-finalists in the last three rugby, rugby league World Cups. Um, they knocked New Zealand out um, at the quarterfinals of the last World Cup in 2017. So while they're not a team that you would necessarily expect to be getting to the final or winning the event, they're also not a team that you would think of as a pushover. So for England to post 50 points and shut them out is pretty impressive, I would say. Were there availability issues for the Fijians or was it blooding new players? Yeah, I think there was a bit of blooding new players. Um, there was also, I think, just the fact that they, uh, you know, they've just got off the plane, uh, whereas England were uh, had the home advantage. Um, so I, I think uh, they were, Fiji were probably trying out a few combinations. It has to be said, their back line, especially their right edge, looked like they hadn't played together at all. Um, when they were in attacking positions, they butchered. You can't even call them chances. They hadn't quite got close enough for it to be a chance, but they butchered good position, shall we say, with stray passes. Um, but England's defence was really good and uh, their attack more clinical. Also, the game was played in driving rain, which probably That's wouldn't not suit. Not great for running rugby. No. Uh, but probably saved Fiji some blushes, I think. Um, England knocked on over the line twice, uh, I think, just because of the conditions. I expect probably would have posted more points if it had been uh, a nice dry day. So relatively clinical against scruffy opponents. Yeah, I think so. And, and again, England weren't playing their best team either. They'd rested a few players who played in the Super League Grand Final. Um, they were obviously trying out a few combinations. There were several players making their debut, uh, including uh, perhaps my favourite new nickname in uh, Rugby League, uh, Victor Radley, Victor the Inflictor, as the Aussies like to call him. <laughs> uh, I think we're going to see a lot of him in this tournament. I'm looking forward to seeing him put some big hits on people. Yeah, that's, that's up there with Twiggy in the middle. Definitely. <laughs> um, and most of the home nations were in warm-up matches as well didn't go quite so well for them. Um, um, Scotland uh, were fairly well beaten by England Knights, which for any uh, person who's not um, a rugby league fan, England Knights is kind of like the old England Saxons team in rugby union, a sort of uh, um, team for emerging players to be given a chance. and Development uh, squad. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, Ireland and Wales both uh, slipped to defeats as well. Um, so, but it's interesting with Wales, 
they said they've got the group of death. They've got Papua New Guinea and Tonga and the Cook Islands. Tonga, everyone's expecting to be semi-finalists or better. Um, Papua New Guinea, you know, perennially do uh, tend to get to the knockout stages. Cook Islands have got a fairly good squad, so I think Wales would do well to pick up a win. But so well. 12 Welsh-born players out of their squad of 24, which is, you know, in terms of legacy, is really, really impressive, I think. Hmm. Uh, is it um, common for the players who've gone to play for Australia and New Zealand to move back to the islands? Increasingly so, no. That, it used to be the case that, as you know, Australia and New Zealand used to cherry-pick the best uh Fijian, Tongan and, New Z- and uh, Samoan players um, and Cook Islanders. Any, um, anyone who had dual citizenship or, you know, who was based permanently in Australia or New Zealand was getting picked. But at the last World Cup, a lot of the Tongans who qualified for New Zealand and one who qualified for Australia, I think there were nine of them altogether, put their hand up to play for Tonga instead. Um, and that led to Tonga going, running onto the semi-finals, beating New Zealand in the group stage, um, beating Australia in the following year, wow. beating Great Britain on the Great Britain tour of 2019. So Tonga have now proved that they can mix it with the f- traditional big three. of They hold victories over all of them. And um, that has in, inspired Samoa to do the same. So the Samoa team that lines up against England on Saturday They've got eight players who played in the NRL Grand Final um, down under in their squad of 24. Um, And they're, in fact, actually no favourites to beat England in that opening match uh, with the bookies. So, Any big names giving back and that sort of thing? Yeah, well, a a lot in the coaching, oddly enough. Uh, We've got Tony Iroh, uh, of the famous Iroh brothers, coaching the Cook Islands. but I think that the the big name still is Jason Tomalolo, the Tonga captain, who would be an absolute certain pick. And of course, there's the possibly the problem of some um, predatory French union clubs. Yeah, um, and of course, one of the downsides for rugby league is the fact that this World Cup is a ch- is a real chance for them to showcase the sport, but it also puts a lot of uh, players in the shop window for uh, rugby union teams with big with deep pockets, um, especially in France, where, as, as, as we know, they're not shy of spending in a few bob. No, but well, the salary cap works slightly differently. Yeah. And, of course, England also marmalised Fiji in the Rugby Union World, uh, Women's World Cup last week, um, with England posting 80 odd points on, on that. So Fiji must be wondering quite what they've done to, to England to warrant dismantlings in both codes at the same weekend. But bad run for them. Yeah, absolutely. I will go on record though and say, despite what the bookies are saying, I fancy England nicking against Samoa on Saturday in in the World Cup. I think the home advantage and the fact that Samoa have only just arrived in the UK and haven't had that warm-up match, whereas England had the run out last week and have had a, a more settled preparation. May mean some more coming just a little bit underdone to that first match. Bit of ring rust to, could be the difference then. Could be. Uh, I may be being optimistic. Um, you know, some more are coming with the intention of winning the tournament. <laughs> yes, indeed. A look at Rugby Union, though, of course, I think the big story is not really what's happening on the field. It's what's happening off the field at Wasps and Worcester. Yeah, uh, the two clubs going to the wall. Yeah. It could lead to a wholesale shake-up of the club system as well, with the Exeter chief executive suggesting the league get cut to 10 teams. Yeah. Uh, rather than the proposed 14 that they were supposed to be going to next season. Yeah, that could be um, could be carnage. Uh, getting down to a 10-team setup. Um, well, with Wasps and Worcester going to the wall, that leaves 11 and makes me worried for my Bath team. There's yeah, and it's hard to, to go. Top, a top flight without Bath <laughs> would have been unthinkable once upon a time. Yeah, but some of the names that have gone down in the past, like the likes of your Harlequins, um, 
yeah. getting relegated does show the big ones can go as long as, but just got to hope they bounce right back up. Yeah, Canada, well, because Canada, Saris. Yeah. Kind of reminded me of what um, Barry Glendening said about supporting Sunderland, though, where uh, you kind of hope they did get relegated um, one year just so that you could see them win some matches the following season. Didn't quite work <laughs> out for him. No. <laughs> Suppose with those yo-yo clubs, it must be a bit strange, wasn't it, to think that uh, yeah, we'll we'll have a season of success at a lower level and then a season of miserable plodding <laughs> at the higher level. Yeah, but of course the other criteria for promotion is whether things like the grounds meet the meet the requirement. So the uh, Cornish Pirates could get stuffed again. Hmm. I always think that looks like a lovely ground to go and watch matches at, though, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Second, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's probably the only challenger to Bath's ground for prettiness. Mm, absolutely. It's, it's very picturesque. Um, on that subject, do you think that rugby, and this applies to both codes, I think, um, makes too much of those, those sort of cosmetic off-field uh, um, set it to say, oh, your ground has to meet X minimum standards. It's got to be all seater. It's got to be twenty thousand capacity. Even though you're probably only going to you're going to be lucky to see twenty thousand in there uh, once a season. Um, all these things. Does it really matter? I, I, I think I'm not so sure it does. I think if, if you've got a club like Cornish Pirates with their their twee little stadium, who cares if they've won promotion on the field? And you've got to have a ground that's sustainable for you. If you're bringing enough enough um, tickets sold to support your club, and someone like the Cornish Pirates, not going to get people down from Newcastle for it, probably. So No. Yeah. They're a little bit I, out of the way. They're not going to get as, as much, and having a large ground will just be a drain. Yeah, exactly. And And I think we all know being in a huge stadium with a small crowd is not a great atmosphere um, for those who've done it. I mean, um, I remember being in the Millennium Stadium for a rugby league international once for Wales against New Zealand. It got 18,000 odd, which was a fantastic crowd for Wales rugby league, but was terrible in an 80 odd thousand capacity stadium. Yeah. I'm watching um, the London Broncos at the at the Valley with, with two closed stands. Yeah. Yeah, it's it not. It really does suck the atmosphere out of it. Whereas you had a, uh, you have a ground that's purpose built for the size of crowd expected, and you'll get a rocking, a much more rocking atmosphere. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The passion for the sustainability of clubs, as you say, I think promoting a club that are just not in any position to financially compete and who are going to end up driving themselves bankrupt trying to com- trying to compete with bigger clubs is not necessarily a great idea but that said they only have to be sustainable for themselves it's about not living beyond your means um you get into things like player development at that point as well yeah you develop the players at yeah. a young age move uh, move them on up to the larger clubs yeah, if you can get that conveyor belt of youth talent coming through, that's one way of being competitive with clubs, with uh, you know, with the resources to sign players that you might not be able to um, to match up to. Um, a place like Cornwall, you think it's a it's a big county and it's not it's not densely populated. You're not going to get huge about county team as well. Yeah, yes, it's true. Yeah, they've got a great tradition of county rugby in in. Uh, in Cornwall. Um, so again, you think, yeah, you could find some mad investor who'd put together a 25,000 seater all stadium, all seater stadium for them, um, and to get 5,000 people in it. Mm. Maybe they'd get to host a, you know, a, a women's international or something every so often, or, or a big cut tie. Uh, but other than that, it would just be, as you say, it would be a drain on their resources to maintain it. They'd be constantly trying to find 
non-sport related uses for it to just to pay for itself. Yeah. yeah. Kind of as long as the stadiums are safe. That's the, the, the key thing, isn't it? You, you do get some of these old hundred odd year old stadiums where they're becoming unsafe for people, then obviously they do have to be modernised. But beyond that, I don't think it's uh, something to get too bent out of shape about. That's my opinion. I think I pretty much agree that it it shouldn't prevent them going up as long as there's no safety implications. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If people have earned it on the on the field, and that was that, and the criteria for getting in was on field success, it seems very harsh to then say, but actually, you don't meet the other requirements. Uh, if a team has a stellar season and they don't get to enjoy the rewards of it, that team gets broken up as well. Yes. And what about the fans as well? Without without the possibility of that pathway to elite level, you know, you think, what are they shouting for? They, they're going and attending every match at home and often away following the, the uh, team around the country hoping to win to win promotion but if promotion's not on the table yeah we won the league and it means nothing yeah again you think those fans are likely to be locked to drift away from the game yeah i mean it, you'll get the the club will get the gets the prize money for coming first mm. but at the same time they don't they don't get to reap the greater financial rewards of rewards of playing in the top tier no, and if you can, um, if you can sell the second tier competition as a worthy thing in its own right, um, you know, brand it and make and get people to care about it individually, then yeah, it's great. If you look at Australia, suppose, the National Rugby yeah, League, if you if the proposal to drop the um, the number of teams in the Premiership in in Union down to eleven, that means there's going to be a, a big name or two in the in the lower tier. At which case, maybe they start paying more attention to the second tier as well. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully those the if those big names go down, they can keep most of their fan base, and, and that means you know bigger paydays for all the smaller clubs around them, um, and hopefully gets a few more of their people to turn out. And as you say, then the, the second tier competition becomes more viable. But um, whether that happens or not, I don't know. Um, I think the the second tier in union is already semi pro. Uh, mm. Yeah, and again, I think we have to compare rugby football to football. Yeah, yeah. And you think I think rugby has a, tries to have a very similar setup. You know, multiple divisions, promotion and relegation between all of them. Um, that's the dream. That works in 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 association football because there is so much money in the game. And there are so many, and there are so many fans attending, even in League One or League Two. So you can honestly believe that a club could run all the way from League Two up to the Premier League within, say, ten years or something, and establish themselves. And it happens, and we've seen it happen. Um, I don't think that pathway is realistic in rugby. I don't think that what money there is is concentrated in the the elite end of the game and is still a tiny, tiny drop compared to the money they've got in association football. And I think Bart is showing you that money doesn't buy success mm. as well. Absolutely. You can, uh, it can be employed to no good effect. <laughs> and then we're into the old adage about football teams being a very good way to turn a large fortune into a small one. Yes, Absolutely. Uh, let's face it, people don't make money owning sports teams. They do it for... Not in this country, anyway. No, <laughs> they do it for prestige, for glamour, for the love of the game. Uh, possibly as a huge tax write-off. <laughs> uh, but they don't do it expecting to make a vast profit. No. Nah. Um, there we go. So... The other big thing that's affecting both Rugby League and Rugby Union, of course, potentially uh, the large legal cases being put together by large groups of retired players, including some very big name players, 
um, who sadly are dealing with the effects of early onset uh, dementia and believe that more should have been done to protect them while they were playing and want to see changes and compensation as a result. Um, in rugby league, probably the most famous player involved is Bobby Goulding, the former England and Great Britain um, and St Helens halfback, because uh, who was an integral part of England's run to the 1995 World Cup final. And in rugby union, Steve Thompson, World Cup winning uh, hooker yeah. uh, for England. And the implications of this, I think, are huge, potentially, um, in how the game is played in the future. <coughs> um, we've already seen over the over the years that we've watched rugby a huge shift in the attitude to head high tackles, uh, to concussions, to shoulder charges. Um, it already has a lot of sort of long in the tooth fans, shall we say, bemoaning that this isn't the game they're used to, that the game has been sanitised too much, that it uh, lacks the physicality it used to have. But that situation is not going to change. That trajectory is going to keep uh, developing, I think. And in that spirit as well, I, I think it's kind of reprehensible when you see things like the... Um the international teams gaming the concussion protocols. Mm. Looking at you, France. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Concussion protocols are there for a good reason. Um, and as you say, to to sneakily abuse them for uh, for um, match day advantage or similar is is really not helping anyone. I, I shouldn't. I should. I think say that the French denied that's what they were doing, but it was one of those things where it very much had the appearance of it, even if they, they claim it didn't have the substance of it. Yeah, yeah, quite. Um, and sometimes <laughs> the appearance is all you need to uh, yeah. leave a bad taste in people's, uh, in people's mouths. Um, I think we are going to have to accept the fact that we're not going to see some of the insane um physicality that we we used to see on rugby pitches and we shouldn't see it um some it of, might even uh go some way to um resolving the arms race in the back as well where they're getting bigger and bigger and faster and stronger mm. uh, maybe the, the rules will change the, the shorter skill players like uh, ultimately the jason robinson types will get a look in again yeah, Shane Williams, the Underwoods, players like that. You think kind of sometimes you look at them and you think, would they, would anyone be giving them the chance in the modern game? Because we're, we're used to having six foot three, 16 stone wingers who can, you know, carry the ball back like a forward. Uh, I, I don't see very little difference in some ways between the forwards and the and the backs in league that's for sure mm. they're, they're physically they're looking more and more similar as time goes on absolutely i think one of the you know there's no there's no secret to the fact that i am first and foremost a rugby league fan who happens to also enjoy rugby union a lot um but one of the things i like about rugby union um has always been the fact that there is more variety of role on the pitch. There is more difference between a winger and a centre, between a centre and a back row forward. Um, even between the halfbacks individually, the scrum half and the fly half have more defined roles. You can't just swap them around. Whereas in rugby league, you'd say things have emerged to the point that we have fewer defined roles. We have front row forwards and back row forwards. We have back row forwards who are often interchangeable with our centres for some reason. Um, we have two half backs, a scrum half and a standoff half. But the truth is, usually in most teams, one of them is organising on the left hand side of the pitch and one of them on the right hand side of the pitch. But they're pretty much interchangeable. Um, you know, the game is still very entertaining and everything. But you, I do think sometimes 
something has been um, lost a little in terms of. And whilst you want the game to remain a full on contact sport and a game of physicality, you want you don't want that to be all about the collision. No. And by taking it away from being all about the collision, hopefully you can help um, with the concussion issues and the headshots. Mm, absolutely. And get um, more open play at the same time with any luck. Uh, I think one thing I've noticed a lot of fans complaining about is when when players' unions are talking about the need to reduce the stress on the players, reduce the number of games played, for example, um, and people are, people will point to seasons gone by where players played 40, 50, 60 games in a season and say, and say well, they could do that holding down a job. Um, and you think they're not noticing, I think, just how much the game has changed physically. As you say, that the players are bigger, the players are stronger than they were as a result. They are nutritionally coached. They they have sports scientists. They have strength and conditioning coach, work, coaches working on them. They hit each other much harder, much faster, and much more, um, many more times in a game. Than much more sustained was, effort. Exactly. I remember watching England play New Zealand in 2015 um, in the Rugby League Test Series that year. And in the second test, England alone made 400 tackles in 80 minutes. It's utterly insane. (laughs) That's got to be twice as many as they were making 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And most of those tackles are coming with a big impact, a big collision. Um, Often two on one, three on one. Yeah, exactly. You think that is a huge, huge stress to put uh, put uh, yourselves under. And I don't think it's unreasonable then for players to say, you know what, let's have um, a 22-game season instead of a 28-game season. Let's have, uh, let's cut, da- cut down or cut out the amount of opposed contacts in training. Um, who knows? I don't don't have all the answers with that, but I, I do think they have, at the elite end of rugby especially, they have a fair point. One of the things I like um, from what I've seen of rugby league is the uh, they have a greater rotation of players during a match than they do in, in <clears> union with players um, coming off and on to the, back onto the pitch. Yeah, that's true. Which is something I'd like to see more of in in Union as well. Reduce yeah, I think the impact, it's the odd. On the one hand, it does give mean that players are getting a breather, um, a chance to recover a bit. On the other hand, that again has fed into that that changing um, physical nature of the player to say, well, we can get a, we can get a player who's. His fitness doesn't need to be the best. If he's only, if we send him on for 10, 15 minutes and say, you just blast the opposition and then we'll pull you off again and give you 20 minutes rest and then you go on in the second half and do the same. Um, there is, whereas, you know, you think some of those players um, would have to look after their cardio a little bit better, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I guess you've got um, a slight equivalent of that in, in union with the bomb squad. Uh, uh, the South African change that comes on to close out matches. Where mm. Just a new front row of intimidating size that gets the other team going, oh, for God's sake. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's good enough to get them a world championship. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it's worth... I mean, all those things, ultimately, they have interesting tactical effects don't they beyond what the rules makers may have envisaged when they put in the, put in the rule i remember at one time they were, they were playing unlimited interchanges in in rugby league and uh manly sea eagles in australia had a player cliff lyons very great creative halfback and goal kicker he was 37 at the time and that, that those unlimited interchanges had probably added two years to his career because he was on and off and on and off to kick goals. It it was getting to yeah. the point where you think we'll end up with an offensive and defensive team like NFL here. And, <laughs> and you don't want a specialised goal kicker who comes on only for that. No, absolutely, absolutely. So um, there is a there is a balance to be had. 
But in terms of the, the legal cases, I think people do say, and we, we say rightly so, players know the risks of the game. But I think in the cases of some of these players, there were risks beyond anything they knew they were signing up for. They they were putting their hands up happily, I think, to accept that they would get broken bones, torn ligaments, things like that, that maybe they wouldn't be as mobile in their 50s as somebody who hadn't played the game, things like that. They weren't expected to get dementia in their 40s, to be forgetting their children's names five years after they stopped playing, things like that. The question is, should anyone in the game have been aware that this was going to happen? And did people do enough to protect them? I think that's going to be much harder to prove. Yeah, if there's if they need to show negligence on the part of the governing bodies, that's going to be way harder to prove. Mm. I'm not sure they can make that case because the science simply wasn't there when they started. Yeah, that is the, the big question, isn't it? You think if we're judging behaviours in the late 90s or the two, early 2000s by science that's known now, was it known then? Yeah. And could people have reasonably been expected to be aware of it and implemented procedures as a result? Um, Which kind of brings us back to the need for rigidly enforced protocols now for headshots. Mm. And of course, another thing that, again, this has come up several times over the years, but it never seems to change. England's um, former England rugby league forward James Graham, who was a brutal prop forward in his day, uh, was saying on his podcast recently that um, we need to get away from the mentality of playing through injury as a badge of honour. Um, and I think he's right. People shouldn't, but we can't help it out ourselves sometimes. I think we remember. I remember Sam Burgess fracturing his uh, cheekbone in the first minute of the NRL Grand Final and playing the whole match and winning. And you can't help but be impressed and think, wow. But at the same time, you think, should that have been allowed to happen? Shouldn't someone have just yanked him off the pitch and said, you're done, boy? Sorry, yeah. it's the grand final, but you're finished. You're not playing. Yeah, completely should should do. Because uh, you end up with situations like, I don't know if you were following the NFL recently with the uh, Miami Dolphins quarterback who came off on a Sunday match with a back injury after a huge shot to the head. And then he gets a basically a whiplash down to the to the to the turf on the Thursday night, and he's um, showing signs of posturing um, in his hands, uh, consistent with massive head trauma. Uh, so he's got himself a huge concussion. He's going to be out for twice as long, and no one knows what the repercussions of that sort of injury is going to be. All mm-hmm. because the team wanted their star to play, and the doc there was an amenable doctor. I don't want to go, I can't say it was deliberately the fault, but the um, the trauma surgeon who certified the player as fit to play again has been fired. Mm. But, and again, the pressure is on medical staff though, isn't it? Medical staff are employed by clubs to get their players on the pitch because that's where they need them. And th- there must be pressure on those doctors to say, you know, it must be tough sometimes for a doctor to turn around to the club and say, I know this is the cup final. I know this is what everything's worked towards, but this man cannot play. And, they, and then someone says, but he could play, couldn't he? Like, yes, he could, but he shouldn't. And yeah, it's a tough call then, isn't it? Um, yeah. But the people need to be looking out for the players because I think players will play. This is what they've trained their whole lives for, these big moments. They, they will say, no, I, I can't let my teammates down. I can't miss out on this. I'm going to push through the pain. And someone should be saying, you know what, it's not your call to make. I'm That's protecting you. Where they should be protected from themselves. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I think in a completely somewhat contradictory frame of mind, let's dial up the jukebox and have a look at a big hit from the jukebox. <laughs> as we watch somebody absolutely smash somebody else on the, on the field of play. But in a clean and wholesome manner. In a clean and wholesome manner, absolutely. So I'm just going to share my screen. And Is there any use? I think I've got it queued up here as well. Uh, 
it seems to be running better this time. Here we go. Oh. Happen to a nicer bloke. I, I suspect that Matt Rogers' ribs still hurt. Yeah, he's he's feeling that now. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And uh, let's get over that. I don't know if Josh Lucy has uh, daughters, but if he does. I really do hope that whenever any of them had a boyfriend coming to pick them up, I just it just uh, just come in. I just just uh, want to show a quick you. Look at this. Something yeah. I want to show you, then. And then just home by ten, yeah. <laughs> yes, Mr. Lucy. <laughs> and, uh, it's a beast of a tackle. It really is. It's. It's not yeah, it's just one of, one of the greats, and though uh, completely legal. Caught him Nothing. mid sidestep. He's trying. He's not planted at all, and just cut into. But yeah. perfectly. And what makes it good is it's a perfectly legal tackle. He gets the shoulder in properly, but just levels him with that. Yeah, absolutely battered him. <laughs> Fantastic. In so, some ways, it's kind of one of the things that drives me nuts when I watch American football is, the, is I think, just tackle the guy properly. You'll round the waist, slide down the legs, but make sure you get your head in the right in the right position when you when you're doing it, and you'll take the guy down. Don't just hit him with the with the armor. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I I just. You just gotta love a tackle like that, mm. uh, unless you're on the end of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, Matt Rogers. It's not like he'd never been tackled before, but I bet he'd never been tackled quite like that before. <laughs> um, I think I'm safe to say Matt Rogers is, was a an abrasive figure in that Australian team. Yeah, I mean. I don't know if it's true that his teammates used to call him Rat Boy at Canberra Raiders before he made the move to Rugby Union. Wouldn't dream of uh, suggesting that was the case, but I might have heard it. <laughs> I'm sure he's a lovely guy. Um, and he was a good player. Hell of a oh, goal yeah. kicker. I think that makes it better. It's yeah. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to just take out some nobody with a tackle like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The fact it's on a dangerous player. Yeah, when you're on a skilled player like like that. One yeah. reason why you always um wince whenever Johnny Wilkinson went into a tackle with his shoulders. Yeah. Absolutely. But he was never shy about it. He hit yeah. hard for a halfback. And I think that's who um Farrell wants to be and just doesn't quite have the technique. No, perhaps not quite as effective there. But um I think, you know. We'll revisit the jukebox for more hits. And if any of you watching have particular tackles you'd like us to pick out and celebrate, we would love to hear about them. Yeah. Please do put that in the comments. Good, clean hit hits that uh, absolutely level people. Yeah. Don't matter where they come from, anywhere in rugby union, anywhere in rugby league. Men's game, women's Men, game. Women's. Yeah. Wheelchair. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm going to uh, my first wheelchair rugby league matches next month in the in the wheelchair World Cup. I'm going to see England take on um, Australia and Ireland against Spain, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what that's like in person. Yeah, how it compares to murder ball. Sorry, wheelchair Indeed. basketball. Indeed. <laughs> and something else to look at, though. The other thing that we'd love to celebrate in rugby, of course, is the great tries. Um, and I thought this uh, this episode we would look at one which, you know, I'm picking this out and it was scored against Wigan, who are my team. Um, but it was just so awesome. Even during the match, I couldn't help but be um, absolutely 
um, you know, on my feet, phrasing it. Take a look at this finish. What, what? No. That, there's no way he's grounded that. Yeah, video ref, we're going to need to see that one again. It goes through. Yeah. It's already going out when he's catching it, surely. Does the flag belong to the linesman or the players? Which <laughs> state of that? State of that. He's grounded it well in there. Yeah, absolutely incredible. And uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now there. I mean, Sorry, bit of background noise there. I shall edit that out. But I mean, Tom Johnston, one of the best wingers in Super League, been incredibly unlucky to miss out for England repeatedly. Once again, injured as a World Cup run, um, rolls around. Although I'm sure he would have been in uh, Sean Wayne's squad for this World Cup if he was fit. But he's known for scoring length of the field tries, electric pace. But that finish, to, as they say, to leap that high above his opposite number, take the ball in the air, get it into his left hand, down in the corner with his feet, I mean, his foot is literally inches away from the touch line at the point he grounds the ball, but well, clearly well, not in touch. What I like is that he's, as he's putting the ball down, he's, his toes are on the ground, his heels are in the air. Yeah. Fairly sure if that heel goes down, he's going to be in touch. Absolutely. And um, Yeah. Outstanding finish, as I say, was one of those, um, and the match was close at that point. It was not a point where I wanted to see Wigan conceding points, but he scored that and just like, what can you say other than well done? That that was my try of the season for 2020. Um, and uh, the amazing thing with Tom Johnston is he's got, it, anyone who's not heard of him, check out his highlight reel. There's a, there's a video um next to the, that one of why he scored in Super League. And he has got corker after corker on there. As I say, some of them where he just op uh, opens up the afterburners and goes the length of the pitch. Others, just awesome finishes like that. But, all in all. It's always good to see um, a speed merchant who can do everything. Yeah. And he's, you know, he, he's physically strong, um, it, it's just, as I say, he's been so unlucky with injuries. He's barely figured for England over the last five years. Um, and, it, you know, it was just cruel again this season. Half, I think it wasn't even halfway through the season he was done for Wakefield. And you think, in World Cup year, again. Um, and it's a huge blow for England. Um, you know, to have a player like that and not be able to test him against... Uh, against the Aussies, against the Kiwis or the Tongans or the Samoans. But not that we're badly off for wingers. Uh, yeah. Um, Ryan Hall are all very good players, but I would have loved to see Tom Johnston get the, ch get the chance. He's young enough that next World Cup rolls around, hopefully he'll get that chance. So with the, with the Rugby League World Cup coming up, uh, anyone stopping Australia? I think you have to say Australia, uh, the favourites. Um, some people have said it's an inexperienced squad. Um, they've got 13 uncapped players in their squad. That is only because Australia have barely played a game for the last three years, thanks to COVID and things like that. It's nothing to do with the quality of the players. All, most of those players would have had several caps by now in a normal so time scale and it has to be said you know rugby league there's far fewer internationals so 
yeah. um, you know, you, you, you get 30 caps in your career. You, that would probably translate into like 90 in a rugby union career. And um, therein lies the conversation for another episode. Which we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll visit. But yeah, I would say what we've, what we've always had with the Rugby League World Cup is Australia plus one of New Zealand or England. Um, which one will it be? This time what we've got is Australia plus four in Samoa, Tonga, New Zealand and England. A lot of people fancy New Zealand. They Their warm-up match was against Leeds Rhinos last weekend. They won 74-0. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, crushing um how are lebanon going lebanon are looking pretty good um they they've they've got some decent players um we've got greece in for the first time they're they're a real unknown quantity they've been given the unenviable task in um, drawn in group a with england and some other um and france making up that group but I think Greece will just look at it and say, you know what, nobody expects anything of us. We'll hit that first game against France with everything we've got and see if we can come away with a win. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting matches through through all the groups where people will be li- um, lining up. Um, everyone will have a goal for the tournament. Um, you know, as I say, Wales are in there with Cook Island, Papua New Guinea and Tonga. They could play really well and lose all three games. Um, so they'll just be aiming up to win a game, I think. Um, and so if they can make it their first, have a target game where they go, we could sneak that one. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, everyone's looking looking to take a victory. France say they've got uh, their coach is saying they may have their best ever squad, but I'm thinking even so. England and Samoa are going to have too much firepower for them. So um, it's going to, you know, they've got to beat one of those to get to the quarterfinals. I don't see it happening, but um, but you never know. You, you do not know. England and Samoa are going to hit each other with everything on Saturday because they know whoever tops the group doesn't have to play one of the other big teams till the semi final and probably will avoid Australia and New Zealand. The likely, likelihood is the top group A, you end up with Tonga in the semi-final, while Australia and New Zealand play each other in the other semi-final. But again, Samoa could shake up any of those teams. So England and Samoa are both going to be putting everything they've got into. That may mean that, um, especially the t- whichever of them loses and is disappointed about that, is ripe for the taking for the French the following, uh, the following week. They may have spent everything, be emotionally on the floor, and who knows? They can't rule out um, an upset. As I said, we know from the last World Cup, Tonga beat New Zealand in the group stage. That was an upset at the time. Though after the the, the few years Tonga had after that, you think actually it wasn't that surprising. But then New Zealand lost to Fiji in the quarterfinals. That was an upset. No getting away from it. Uh, so, yeah. It's going to be it's going to it's going to be well worth watching. And the great thing is, every single one, all sixty-one games, live on the BBC. So can't complain uh, about the free-to-air platform. Exactly, huge, huge opportunity for rugby league. Huge opportunity for a few players to make names of themselves uh, beyond the the uh, heartlands of the game. And uh, hopefully, it'll be. It'll be it'll be great. I just think I just really hope England get off to a good start because it could just knock a, being being a home tournament. If England get beat a, a beat first up and are struggling, it could just uh, take a little bit of the impetus away from the tournament. Yeah. Um, but who knows? And we're expecting to break crowd records all over the place. So, um, England's women are expecting to have the biggest crowd ever for a, a women's rugby match um, in this country. In their in their opener, um, we've got Brazil in the Women's World Cup. Thirty-one nations altogether across all three World Cups, yeah. uh, which is unheard of representation for rugby league. Um, so all good stuff. Yeah, and um, no doubt we will catch up about it here next time. Yep. Yeah. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Me too. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Let's do it again. Yeah, why not? And any suggestions for 
anything you'd like us to cover, pop it in the comments. Let us know. Keep it clean. Yes, do keep it clean and no backbiting, please. We know most of you watching this, you're either going to be a rugby union fan or a rugby league fan. Oddballs like us who watch both codes a lot are quite unusual. Uh, that's fine. Just if you haven't got anything nice to say about the other code, I'd rather you didn't say anything at all. Just celebrate the one you like in that case, because uh, this is about celebrating the oval ball and looking down on people who play the round ball game, not looking down on each other. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Take care.